he was chosen to lead one of Charleston's most oldest congregations after the passing of Reverend Alfonso Blake. And now, seven years later, Leonard Griffin is carrying on that legacy of Moore Street Baptist Church through his powerful sermons and leadership. I had a chance to talk with Reverend Griffin for this edition of Quint Reports. Well, you know, I've known you for a while. I know that you're the guy that likes Saxby's. <laughs> yeah. You're the guy that likes social media. Yeah. You're the guy that loves to smile. Yeah. You are the guy that preaches the powerful sermons on Sundays. But for those people who don't already know, who's Leonard Griffin? Husband, father, pastor, preacher, yes. Christian educator, uh, and the son mm -hmm. of two persons who went through their challenges in life and uh, taught me quite a bit growing up. So that, that's it in a nutshell. Yes. Well, you became pastor of Morris Street Baptist Church in 2006 after the sudden death of uh, Reverend Blake. How difficult has that been to fill those big shoes? Uh, actually, it was 2005, okay. uh, March of 2005, when I arrived here in Charleston. Okay. And uh, really didn't consider myself filling Reverend Blake's shoes. Okay. Uh, Reverend Blake was such an icon in Charleston and, and across this nation, really. Yes. Um, that I just saw myself coming to build a block on top of what he had done. Because, uh, you know, my shoes are a little smaller than his, I think. <laughs> Well, listen, you guys recently celebrated your 147th anniversary. Right. Talk to me about that. That was phenomenal. I uh, really enjoyed the, the build-up and the uh, celebration of that. Uh, the church has a tremendous heritage and history of being involved in the community. Sure. And uh, just celebrating all of that heritage and history was tremendous for us. Uh, got a lot of the various ministries of the church involved, and uh, people were excited about it. The community has been excited about it, and we had great speakers during the uh, celebration. Well, listen, I've been to your church on plenty of times, and I actually went to a recent sermon, Palm Sunday and last Sunday. Okay. Um, tell me, what is your favorite sermon so far since being at Moore Street? Oh, wow. I don't know if I, don't know if I could come up with a favorite. Um, yes. But one that sticks with me a lot is, is one that is entitled The Perfect Church, uh, where we... The Lord has led me to look at the book of Acts yes. uh, and several passages of scripture there that speak about the church and what the church should be about. Uh, and that sermon touches on, you know, the church being at prayer, yes. the church doing things in the community, right. the church being on one accord, and, and the church reaching beyond its walls. Uh, so that particular sermon sort of sticks with me. Well, let's talk about Syracuse, New York. Oh, boy. I understand that that was a spiritually depressed place for you. It was. Uh, even though there were some positive things that happened in my life and in, the, in my family uh, during that period, it was a very challenging place for ministry. Uh, many jobs had dried up in the, in the area. Carrier Corporation had, was one of the major employers in the area. And uh, Carrier cut back their workforce uh, two-thirds. And that was a major blow to the uh, economy of the city. Would you say that God wanted you to be here preaching in Charleston? I believe ultimately yes, uh, that this is where God would have me serve uh, at this stage in this period of my ministry. Yes. And I felt the call wow. to Charleston. And so out of all of the churches in Charleston, why Moore Street Baptist Church? I guess there were some similarities between my ministry and Reverend Blake's ministry here okay. at Marsh Street Baptist. Uh, we're both very much involved in the social aspects of ministry, uh, very much involved in preaching the, and teaching the gospel. Sure. Uh, yes. So there was a great compliment in ministries there. Uh, but it also uh, fit my skill set. Um, in Marsh College, I was trained as pastor, pastoral ministry. Uh, with emphasis in religious education. And at Colgate Rochester, Prozer Divinity School, uh, those skills were honed to be involved in a community setting for ministry. Um, and I guess the personality of this preacher and this people uh, matched. Yes. Uh, and so God put us two together. Well, you once told a woman doing Bible study as a kid when she asked you what you wanted to be, you told her a pastor. Why, Pastor? I had uh, great experience with my pastor in Edgefield County, yes, uh, the, yes. Reverend, the Reverend Ernest Simmons, late Reverend Simmons. Okay. Uh, 
had a great impact on my life. Uh, watched him, listened to him, and learned much from him. Okay. Uh, what I didn't realize that was happening was that I was beginning to to model uh, him in quite you know several ways, and it just became a natural answer when she asked that question of all the children that were there. Yes. When she came around to me, that just seemed like a natural answer. Wow. Uh, and now, you know, many years later, realized that it was it was God speaking to me. Wow. Well, take me back to the first sermon you preached at your father's church, uh, where he grew up in. To me, it feels like it had to be nerve-wracking. <laughs> was it? it? It was quite, every sermon is nerve-wracking. Sure, I'm sure. Uh, because I'm nervous before every time I stand behind that sacred desk. Wow. Uh, it's such a tremendous place of honor, such a tremendous place of respect. Yes. Uh, and, and I approach it with that mindset. Okay. So I'm nervous every time. Wow. But that first sermon, uh, I didn't sleep well the night before. Um, I was a nervous wreck until I actually stood to preach. Uh, it was at that moment that the Spirit just had me yes. and uh, allowed me to speak what God would have me to speak. Um, that first sermon was, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Wow. So. Interesting. <laughs> Well, let me tell you about this. Uh, you know, I read that years ago, you slammed your brand new Pontiac Grand Am between two trees in a ditch. Would you say after surviving that crash that God had a perfect plan for you? Perfect, I guess it may have been perfect from God's perspective. Okay. Uh, but for me, it was, it was a beginning of, of a maturity that I needed to attain. Okay. Uh, it also helped me to realize that if I stayed on that road, stayed in that, on that part of the journey that I was on, uh, that there would be a negative end to that. Um, it helped me to realize how fragile life was uh, and is, yes. and helped me to recognize that I needed to listen for the voice of God. Uh, God then directed my path. Uh, certain folks I needed to be with and in class with, sure. classes I needed to take, uh, there were certain preparations I needed, personally and professionally. Sure. Uh, and, and it was that bulwark moment that really helped me to get there. Well, I understand that, you know, growing up in Edgefield was very difficult for you. You basically made do with what you had. Tell me, how did you survive that? Great parents, okay. uh, no, even though they had you know, their challenges personally. Sure. Um, we were not a very uh, rich family total of eight children and two parents so with ten people in the house that's going to really require quite a bit. Sure, sure. Uh, but by God's help and those two parents that you know, kept their hands in the Lord's hand, yes. uh, we were able to make it. But learn so much about having to make do. Yes. Use what you have. Uh, you're not going to always have a silver platter. You're not going to always have everything handed to you. That's true. Uh, so we learned how to adjust on the fly, as it were. Yes. Well, talk to me about your sister, Tawana, who died at age eight. From Tanya. Tanya, excuse Tanya. me. Um, I understand that it is hard to talk about, but what are your memories of her? You know, it's a very interesting uh, period right now. A very close friend of mine, a pastor, uh, had a 33-year-old daughter who was mentally challenged, and uh, she recently passed away uh, after having gone through a very difficult life, 33 years. Uh, and it brought, it flooded my mind with memories of my sister uh, because she was somewhat challenged, uh, never did anything for herself uh, as she lived. Okay. And so I, I remembered her fondly, but many, many memories came back to me uh, of how we had to care for her. Sure, sure. Uh, of how she would interact with us. She would always have this big, beaming smile on her face. Really? Uh, and we could make her laugh, and uh, that seemed to bring her much joy and much comfort. Uh, but I, I remember how difficult it was um, to get the news that she had passed away. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I'm only uh, two years older than she was. Okay. Uh, so it, would, it was a very difficult piece for me uh, and really, the very first time I had to deal with death on my own, sure. you know, my own life. Right. Uh, I had you know, 
grandparents that had passed away, but nothing impacted me more than having to experience her going away. Um, we miss her tremendous. I bet you do. Well, switching gears, I understand that you actually went into the Navy after graduating from high school. <laughs> well, you know, tell me about that. I'm curious. What did the Navy do for you? Because you traveled around the world with the Navy. Right, yeah. I did. And that was one of the major reasons I chose the Navy over some of the other branches. Wow. Um, I investigated the Army and, and discovered that when you go to the Army at that time, everybody had to go to Germany. And I didn't want to go to Germany <laughs> uh, and just stay there. Right, you know, right, visit right. was fine. Yes. Uh, but the Navy afforded me the opportunity to go many places in a short period of my life. Sure. Uh, but it also uh, taught me, being in the Navy taught me about leadership. Okay. Uh, what it means to follow and what it means to be a leader. Sure. And um, being in the military, you learn quickly to follow orders. Yes, you do. And uh, so I, I really appreciate those years of being in the Navy and having learned a little bit about leadership. That is awesome. You know, I was, you know, while doing my research, I understand that your wife, Wanda Lynn, did not want to marry a preacher. <laughs> That's correct. Saying that it would take time away from the family. Correct. Why did she marry you? Must be love. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but really, we, we fell in love over a very short period of time. Wow. And uh, have been married now. July will celebrate 21 years. That's right. And uh, she came to a realization that God had put us together. Yes. yes. And we both did acknowledged and um, testified to that, that God brought us together. Yes, yes. And uh, because he brought us together, we knew he would keep us yes, yes. together. So she overcame those phobias, if you will, sure, sure. Uh, to, to say yes when I proposed. Wow. And what has been the secret to your 21-year marriage? We keep God in our marriage. Yes. God is the glue, if you will, yes. uh, that maintains uh, our marriage. Yes. Uh, but we have fun. That's good. We have fun with each other. We have fun with our children. We have fun in ministry. Oh, yes. uh, we enjoy life together. And, and we share everything together. Okay. And so those things have helped us. And, of course, prayer, reading the word, yes. and, and keeping God in the midst. That is awesome. You guys also have two children, one son and one daughter. What do they think of your, as you, the father, as a preacher? <laughs> My daughter has, uh, and this is not public knowledge yet, okay. but she has what she calls a book of sermons. Wow. She has written or, or has drawn some pictures right. uh, that, will, that she would use as illustrations wow. in her quote unquote sermons. Yes. Uh, so she has, and has shown a great respect for the ministry, a great love for the ministry, yes. a great love for music in the church. Yes. Uh, and our son, uh, sometimes he wants to come to church and sometimes yeah. he doesn't like any typical kid, sure. uh, but they have embraced ministry for the most part. Wow. Well, describe to me the following in one word, God. That's a difficult, uh, an awesome, loving, merciful, uh, compassionate, comforting, uh, intelligent spirit yes. who leads me, who guides me, loves me, yes. and has saved me. Edgefield. Home. I uh, love to go there. It's a, place, it's a place that I love, even though it, it has its challenges. Sure. It has been uh, a welcoming place to me uh, all my life. And, uh, my mother and a few other relatives still live there. Oh, good. Uh, so I get to visit uh, quite often. Yes. One word to describe fishing. Oh, <laughs> goodness. It's akin to winning disciples. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, but I love it, and in fact, uh, one of the last things that my father and I did before I enlisted in the military okay. was to go fishing. Wow. We went fishing together, and uh, the very next day, I caught the bus to Columbia to, to make my way to uh, Chicago for uh, boot camp. Okay. Uh, so fishing is close to my heart, That's even though I don't get to do it as much as I like. Really? <laughs> I, yeah, well... Maybe one day you will. I hope so. One word to describe cold red Mountain Dew. <laughs> Sugary. 
and full of caffeine. Really? <laughs> yes. One word to describe Moore Street Baptist Church. A great place to serve. Yes. A great place to serve. I love the people. I love the ministry here. Yes. And love what God is doing. One word to describe Leonard Griffin. Complicated. <laughs> That's an easy one. Complicated. You don't seem complicated to me. You seem very outgoing, easygoing, you know. Uh, that too. Okay. That too. Uh, but I have my hands and my talents are pulling me in so many different areas uh, that it's very difficult to kind of settle uh, in one particular area. Well, you know, Reverend Sharon Perry from Syracuse, New York, once called you a visionary. Mm -hmm. As we sit in this August building, what is your vision for Moore Street Baptist Church? That we would be a greater presence and a more effective presence in Charleston um, for the Lord in, in reaching uh, the masses of people uh, from all backgrounds. And so when you look into your crystal ball, what do you see in your future? Uh, continuing to serve God in this capacity as pastor, yes. uh, perhaps another 15 to 20 years, uh, and then hopefully uh, moving to the academy uh, to give back in, in that arena yes. uh, to serve as a professor or a teacher of some type. That would be awesome. Well, Reverend Griffin, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. I've enjoyed it. I'm glad to hear that. All right. Okay.